Welcome back to Exquisitely Aligned. I'm Gina Meyer Vincent, the host and your personal soul shifter, here to help you define and design the future you desire and deserve. The one where essentially you become exactly what's missing in the world. And today I'm excited to introduce you to a woman who has done exactly that. Today I have with me Melissa Kellogg Lewick. Melissa is an entrepreneurial pioneer creating her business online in 2005, before online coaching businesses were cool. Her style of creating simple, joyful, and profitable businesses uh, profitable businesses, and her principles for what she teaches now were born out of tragedy. Living through 9-11 in the New York City area, she's a marketing and business coach and teaches women how to create financial freedom through entrepreneurship. Melissa believes that any woman is capable of creating financial freedom through entrepreneurship. Her mission is to surround female entrepreneurs with community, teaching, coaching, and services they need to create the business and impact they desire. All words that I enjoy, Melissa. She's a podcaster, speaker, coach, women's ice hockey player, mom, wife, and she's coming to us today from Colorado where she lives. So welcome, Melissa. I am so happy to share this time and the mic with you today. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So Melissa. I'm so glad to be here. This is going to be, yes, going to be fun. I've really been looking forward to it. Yes. So uh, when I read the part about living through 9-11, um, I actually, as a New Yorker, was no longer living there, or, or how should I say, New York uh, native. That's where I was born and raised for more than two decades. Um, I actually was not living there at the time. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'll never forget that day because I was sitting at my desk in my quiet house. My husband was working out of the house back then. Now we both have home offices, but he was out of the house and um, I was all alone with our two cats and the phone had rang and it was somebody I did business with. And she said, you know, is your family okay? And I was like, good morning, what's going on? You know, I didn't have on the radio or the television. And so this was my wake up call to what was going on. And then it just all broke loose. So if you can share with us, because I always think there are pivotal, 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 I can't speak English, moments in our lives that do change, you know, how we see things. I'd love to hear from you how that all unfolded for you, because I know it was not a phone call. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I remember the day, that day, like it was yesterday, right? Like I could take myself back um, so easily. Yeah. Um, but at the time, uh, at that time, I was working in marketing and sales for an internet software integrator. And mm -hmm. I had um, like the five, five states around New York as my territory. Mm -hmm. So I was traveling a lot. And in the air a lot, as well as in Manhattan a lot. Yeah. And so I had had meetings in lower Manhattan on Monday and I had meetings scheduled for Wednesday, but on Tuesday, which was 9-11, I happened to be home and had just had a beautiful run down by the water and went home to take a shower and get ready for work, turned on the TV. And of course I saw what was happening um, you know, it was after the first plane had hit. And yeah. so, you know, obviously we didn't know what was going on. Um, all the cell towers in that area and the, a lot of the phone connection equipment was on top of the world trade center. And uh -huh. so when, you know, the, the towers went down, so did a lot of communications. So yes. my family couldn't reach me. All the phone lines were jammed. I couldn't, you know, we couldn't get on the internet. Like there was just, um, it was very isolating, right? Yes. And um, I realized in that, in that moment, in that time that, um, and, you know, I, I lost 
friends and I was a recent graduate student. I got my MBA in New York and uh, recently graduated. So a lot of my classmates, mm. uh, I, I lost a, a couple, fortunately only a couple of classmates, um, 31 people from the town I was living in never mm. came home to work that day. Um, and so it was just a, a really, a really sad and tragic time. But for me, you know, what stood out is like all these people went or all these people did that day is go to work and yeah. didn't come home. You know, right. That, that was, was the biggest. I mean, <laughs> that for their me. worst defense, they went to help, went to work that day. Exactly. And so, you know, I was alone and I had no communications. I was alone in my apartment, right? We couldn't get mm -hmm. called in or out. And mm -hmm. my family didn't know where I was. And they were all here in Colorado. Mm. So um, so for me, it, the question was, if I go to work tomorrow and I don't come home, is this how I want my life to end? Do I right. want to be this disconnected? And yeah. the answer was <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think we have that choice, right, to come to that realization or stay in sadness, sorrow, anger, even, you know, all the emotions that go with such tragic loss, grief, um, etc. Uh, you know, and and to come to that revelation you know, mm -hmm. is such a beautiful thing. And, and oftentimes we need some space to be able to do that. Maybe we need to be able to speak to some, you know, have cell service to get the words out. You know, for me, I, as you can see, Melissa, I speak with my hands. So <laughs> my husband once said, the person on the other end of the phone can't see your hands going. This was before, you know, <laughs> we could do video calls, but, yeah. um, but, you know, for me, I, I need to move through these emotions. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a huge revelation. I mean, especially at, at a young age, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I was year. Yeah. I just turned 30, which mm -hmm. was a big year for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, just, yeah, for change. So, so I spent that next decade between my 30s and 40. Um, really asking myself and and discovering for myself how I could have a life and also be able to pursue a business. And I loved entrepreneurship. I loved the work I was doing, but I didn't love working all the time and not mm -hmm. having a full life. It was very unbalanced for me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I love that you use the words work and life and unbalanced or imbalanced. Um, and I always feel like it, there is so much more. Life is just a four letter word, but there are so many facets in it, kind of like a diamond, you know, that mm -hmm. that make us come to life. So if you don't mind, I know this is a very personal question, but what what were those? What do you classify as your life? I know now you play ice hockey. I don't know if you always have. Um, I never have. I'm not really very um, elegant on the ice. Let's say that. So, <laughs> you would not be elegant on the ice either, honestly. <laughs> That's why we wear full gear. So you fall down a lot. <laughs> I would rather be on my rollerblades or roller skates than the ice. But um, but you would not select me for your team. So what? What were the things that maybe beforehand you were missing and that you wanted to bring in? And then how did you do that? Yeah. So at that time, I was early on in my professional career. So working a lot, really just striving, you know, chasing the almighty dollar. <laughs> and um, I think some of my friendships, I had some really great friends that I had bonded with in my MBA program. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get to see each other much. Everyone mm -hmm. was traveling and working a lot. Um, and I wanted to get married and have a family. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, not nothing in the, the prospects for that. I was dating mm -hmm. a lot, but nothing, you know, no good candidates. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, I understand. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> And so, and I missed my family, like all of my family yeah. was outside of New York and I missed being close to them. My parents, my siblings were all very close. 
And mm-hmm. so I felt disconnected from my family as well. And, yeah. um, and my health, I wasn't really that healthy. You know, I, I mm-hmm. was, wasn't really taking care of my body. And, um, so there was definitely a lot of, of places that, you know, I was realizing at that time that this is not how I wanted to live the next 10 years of my life. That is a statement I hear all the time from, uh, uh, you know, an older gentleman who is looking to retire a client of mine to someone in their 40s. I don't want to live the next one said 10 years the way I did the past. The other one said the 20. I don't want to live my next 20. And I think I've asked a few people that question, you know, not on the show, but just in a one-on-one conversation Mm -hmm. where they were kind of telling me a couple of things that maybe didn't feel right in their life. And, you know, for me, I think it's tragic when something doesn't feel right in your life, because like you living through 9-11, I think, you know, my husband's journey with his health and how we nearly lost him with a two-year-old and a kindergartner in the house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was like, I, now I look and I'm like, no, that can't be. And I, I asked someone, you know, would you like to live the next 10 years the way you've lived the past 10? And they were like, you know what? No one's ever asked me that. And I think that's, that's like a really key piece. And I think that you're right, chasing the dollar or chasing the dream or whatever society tells us is, you know, those check boxes, I like to say, yeah. it's not always fulfilling. And it isn't, it, like you said, as you're running this way towards that, your parents are further away, those siblings you like to laugh with and, you know, mm-hmm. eat dinner. I don't know. I'm an Italian, so I do like to eat. But, we uh, like to eat too. <laughs> I'm not Italian, but we pretend we are, I think. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that time around the dinner table, that time laughing and reconnecting and, you know, those, th- that's why to when some people say work-life balance, it's like, yeah, there's, there's multiple pieces to that. Like you mentioned, your health, family, relationships, like your friends from the BA, uh, MBA program, mm-hmm. you know, and I know for me, those were the key pieces that I felt totally disconnected from as Mark was starting to heal after his kidney and liver transplant. Mm-hmm. Those were the pieces on a Tuesday morning when the sun was uh, I chose the sunniest seat I could find while he was getting a test that I wasn't allowed to be in because of the radiation. And so I sat in the sunniest part of the room at Mayo and I took out a notepad and I just started writing all the things I had given up for about two years. Mm. And those were the things, healthy meals, you know, like having fun cooking a healthy meal. When your time is so limited because you're working crazy hours or starting new in your field. Well, I'm assuming you were newer in your field, right? Yeah. Because you mm-hmm. just finished your M- or somewhat just finished your MBA. So yeah. how did you, so when this revelation came about, sometimes I feel like we have naysayers that come out of the woodwork. They could be just someone at the cash register when you're buying groceries, but And then sometimes they could be ourselves. Like, do Mm -hmm. I, is this really worth it? Or is this really something I can achieve? Did you face anyone who um, kind of, I don't want to say they were a naysayer, but they kind of alluded to that way of thinking? For sure. I think my, um, I mean, I'll call it a delusion now. It wasn't a delusion, but I really (laughs) believed that I could have it all, right? That I could. (laughs) have a great career, be an entrepreneur, like really feed that part of myself and have, you know, a great uh, relationship, even get married, Mm -hmm. have children, be a mom. And yeah, pretty much all of the um, women in my family were naysayers (laughs) (laughs) because it's like for my mother's generation and older, they were not allowed to have both, right? I have goosebumps. Um, yes. Yeah. That I, I feel so like Melissa, that, like, no, yeah. you can't, you can't be a career woman and have healthy children. You can't have a good marriage and have 
you know, a successful million dollar business. Like mm-hmm. those things aren't possible. They're mutually exclusive. Right. But I didn't believe that. I just knew that it could be possible. I don't know where it came from, but I was like, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I think that um, we are more alike than I thought. So I am having a lot right? of fun getting to know you better because I think that sometimes we know it. The way I would describe it, Melissa, is for me, it's like an all knowing. It's mm. like this with every ounce of my being, I know that I will set out and do whatever it is. And there was one point where my mother said, you know, Gina, I knew you would be able to do that. And uh, I forgot what it was. May have been even like nursing my son, which was something I wasn't really like enthralled with the idea. But when I read the proof of the healthy benefits, I was like, okay, I'm sold, you know? Um, And I was converted, I guess. And um, I think that's when she said to me, like, if something is challenging for you, I know you're going to like, go go for it. Like you're going to get to the other side. But it's, it is true. I think that there are generations that have different beliefs than us. There was a YouTube the kids sent me that, um, I mean, I couldn't stop laughing. I should have earmarked it, but it was showing how different generations answer the phone, how different generations do different things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm such a Gen X. It's not funny, you know? Hello, this is Gina. They're like, yeah, people know who they're calling because it's a cell number, mom. They're not calling, (laughs) you know, they're not calling an office with 30 people they're not calling the house I was like oh yeah I guess guess you're right but we do have those belief systems around us and so how did will you let me see if I can ask this question properly so Melissa growing up um, did you know that you might be faced with at this point naysayers coming at you like no you can only have this or that they're each independent were you were you expecting and were you ready or did you feel they would have the same awakening as you did after 9 11. yeah i think that any naysayer well there's naysayers that i definitely had in my head right (laughs) <laughs> and then there's the naysayers um, in my family. And it was more like I knew, I mean, just the fact that I had moved to New York, not knowing a soul mm-hmm. and, you know, this farm girl from Colorado <laughs> and decided to pursue my dream. Mm-hmm. I had been dreaming and talking about moving to New York since I was a nine year old girl. And so that part I think was not a surprise for them, but it's really the um, the me going into an MBA program and continuing to pursue a career and an education over pursuing marriage and yeah. having children. You know, this whole journey for me was something that was countercultural in my family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so I had observed and and heard that my entire life. So at this point in my life, like I knew that I wasn't really following the script for (laughs) that that the other women in, you know, in prior generations had followed. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, you know, I think some of us dance to a different beat and, uh, find our way in a different way. So that that's wonderful. So then how did you start implementing these desires that you had into your life because with work and also uh, in your home life outside of the office. Yeah. So um, as a result of after 9-11, I got laid off from my Mm. job because it was like the internet crap, you know, the the boom was busting. And so I got laid off from work. Wow. And um, I had also decided that I wanted to move back to Colorado to be closer to family. And so uh, 9-11 happened in September. And by the mm-hmm. April of 2002, I had moved yeah. back to Colorado. So wow. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And I moved in with a friend of mine that I actually 
that had done the same thing, moved from New York to Colorado. Yeah. And she was a couple of months ahead of me, but we were friends, acquaintances in New York and she needed a roommate and I needed a place to live. So I moved in with her. So we were, you know, two New Yorkers just having fun in, we moved to Boulder, Colorado and mm -hmm. We moved downtown, got some cruiser bikes, beach cruiser bikes, and just had a great old time, you know, uh, exploring and being single ladies in Boulder. So, mm -hmm. um, but by November of that year, 2002, I met my now husband and it's just like, you know how, when you, when you have a desire yeah, and you put it into motion and you just mm -hmm. take one step at a time. Mm -hmm. The breadcrumbs just lead you mm -hmm. to manifesting that future that you want. And yeah. so it just, I mean, I like to say it all happened, but it, I mean, I know I put it into motion, but it all came <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah. I like to think that, um, cause I've had some conversations with people regarding manifesting or how things come together, but I think it's making those deliberate intentional decisions like you did to not just talk about going back to Colorado, but to making it happen. I, th I think we have these three divine resources, time, money, and energy. And we, when we really vote all day long or decide all day long or put the intention of, I'm going to skip that cup of Starbucks coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I wouldn't buy it anyway, but, um, you know, that cup of tea and make it at home because I want to buy an airline ticket or I want to travel the world or I want to move back to Colorado, whatever that is, whatever we're, you know, desiring. And um, I love that that all unfolded so beautifully. And I think we have to always keep that in mind of, you know, what are we focusing on and how are we going about moving back, finding a wonderful man, you know, planning a wedding. I mean, that that's um, incredible. So when did you get married, Melissa? So I met him in 2002 and we were married in 2006. So we oh, dated wow. for a while. Yeah. Um, I moved, ended up after a year and a half of us dating, I moved uh, to be closer to him in Vail. He lived near Vail, Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. So I moved up there and that's when I started my business because oh. I um, was doing a lot of freelance things uh, in the local area. And then when I moved up there, I was like, well, I don't want to work. Most people work, career people worked in the resort industry, you oh. know, for Vail resorts and, you know, for the tourism industry. And that really wasn't my jam. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. I'll just start my own company then. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that. <laughs> Yeah, of yeah. course. Why not? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That is um that is just so beautiful. And um I know so is that the company that I know today or yeah. is, is that okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so that's uh when I really started my, you know, quote unquote online business, right? Because I I had some clients in Vail, but um the bulk of my clients were outside of the area. And I would just work with them online or um, one client uh, that I had in Boulder, I would, you know, drive down once a month or something and go visit them. And um, but I worked remotely. And so it was kind of working remote, you know, like it's so normal now, uh, but it wasn't then. Right. And people were very astonished that I could, you know, grow a business like this. <laughs> Well, what a futurist you are, correct? Yeah. You know, being able to, yes, life has changed so much, hasn't it? Between 9-11 and then COVID. And um, it's just, I think back and it's, you know, I'm 55 now, which some days is very hard for me to to grasp. Right. And I, I think, yes, very much. Yeah. So I can relate. It's like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Now, when I was 53, I felt like I was 83 because I was waiting for my hip to be replaced. And the next oh. year at 54, I was waiting for my shoulder to be replaced. But now that I'm pain free again and foot loose and fancy free again, it is, yes, it is hard to believe. But I look back and I think 
how growing up, I never thought that either of us would experience uh, the word I never knew, which was pandemic. And then watching, you know, having grown up in New York, watching the, the World Trade Center just collapse and, and life change so, so quickly. Nor did I know that I'd lived through my husband having a double organ transplant because I didn't even know that was a thing. So, you know, it's, it's um, very enlightening. Sometimes I feel like I lived a million, li like a cat living nine lives, like I'm, I'm in life seven or something. Um, yeah. So I have to ask because I grew up in New York and of course hockey was a, a big deal, but I'd love to know about women's ice hockey. How on earth, on <laughs> when you were nine, did you know that you wanted to do this or how did this happen? Yeah, it's a, it's funny. I um I was never a skater. I always loved watching hockey. I used to go to Madison Square Garden and watch Wayne Gretzky play hockey. And I loved the game and um and that is a gift from my father. He oh. moved. He was an upstate New Yorker, Buffalo. Yeah, huge uh, fan of hockey. <laughs> And when he moved to Colorado, there was no hockey. So he took up mm -hmm. motocross and rode motorcycles, but he gave us the love of watching hockey. So I love the sport, um, but I never thought I would ever play it. I mean, girls didn't play hockey when we were <laughs> in school. <laughs> I was before Title IX. And, um, but when I was uh, living up in the mountains, we had moved to a new town. Um, I had two little kids. Uh, a three-year-old and a newborn. And we moved to this new town and I didn't know how to meet people because I, you know, before having kids was just kind of the young professional would go out and, you know, to the nightlife and hang out. I had a lot of friends, right? Yeah. But I didn't have any mom friends and didn't know how to meet people. And my OB nurse, when my son was born, she's like, oh, well, all the women on Sunday nights go up to the rink and play hockey. And the rink was like a half a mile from my house. And then this gal that I met at a, a barbecue restaurant, I, you know, quote unquote, picked her up. I was, you know, trying to make friends. Right. <laughs> and I asked her, I was like, where do you know, what do you, you know, what do you guys do for fun around here? And she's like, we all go up to the rink on Sunday nights and play hockey and drink beer. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to play hockey then. <laughs> and I was 40, 41 years old uh, when I decided to start playing hockey. And my husband thought I was nuts, but I was like, I got to get the heck out of here, right? I have these two little kids and I need some time away from the house. And so that's how I got started with hockey. I'm sorry to be laughing so hard. <laughs> I'm just like, I love meeting people like you. I very much, you know, but I would have to say that would be an all time new one for me. <laughs> and I think my husband would be like, I'm sorry. I don't think I heard you this time. What did you say? You know, with my loud voice. What? Wait, what? <laughs> so, and I was going to ask you, what did your husband say? Like, wait, what? So I'm glad. Exactly. You know. Yeah. He was like, wait, what? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? I'm like, I have to get, I mean, that's the desperation. I had to get out of the house, right? <laughs> Well, uh, my kids were never so close. Uh, they're almost four years apart. So I can imagine with a three-year-old and a newborn, but I can't even imagine how tired my body would have been. And then having to tie up, lace up my skates and with equipment on and be coordinated. So um, I'm envisioning myself as the Michelin, uh, the Michelin tire, you know, like, yeah, that's kind of how it is with all the equipment, right? Yeah. But it doesn't hurt really fall have... down as much, so. Oh, my gosh. That is so fabulous. Um, so do you still live in that area where you would learn so, how to play no, hockey? So, no. Um, we lived in the Vale Valley for about 11 years, and then um, my husband's work uh, changed, and he needed to be closer to the airport um, mm -hmm. in Denver because you know, it's not a real easy drive if you're traveling sure. a lot to go back and forth to the airport, airport from Vail. Um, for those that have been there, they understand. But um, 
So we needed to be closer to the airport. And I said, well, it, you know, having two little kids with him traveling all the time, I was like, well, I want to be closer to my family if that's the situation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we ended up moving back to my hometown, which I hadn't lived in wow. since I left, you know, as a high school graduate 25 years earlier. So, <laughs> so it's been great. And now uh, all of my siblings um, now live in the area with their mm -hmm. spouses and kids. And so. We have, yeah. we have a grand old time here. Yeah. And how old are your children now, Melissa? So I have a 14 year old daughter. She's soon to be mm -hmm. 15 in a few days and a 12 year old son. So, okay. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. They, um, and those birthdays come up fast, right? It's like, wow, how are you going to be 15 in a few days? That's incredible. And driving. So and yes. Goodness. Be careful. <laughs> I've been through that now twice. So um, our son is getting ready to graduate college and our daughter graduate high school here in oh. May. So um, yeah. it's uh, quite crazy. 21 and, and she just turned 18. But um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now, do your uh, children play ice hockey? Did they get inspired? <laughs> They did when they were younger. Um, they lasted till, I don't know, uh, till about eight or 10 years old. And then they were like, no, we're out. We don't want to do this anymore. So, okay. <laughs> Which was sad because I really loved being a hockey mom. I coached my son's little, you know, team of five to eight year olds and it was really fun, but yeah, it's not about awesome. me. So. <laughs> <laughs> And who knows, maybe when they turn 41, they may go back to playing ice hockey. You just never know, right? I always feel like there's a, yeah. a perfect time time and place um, and space for us to do the things that uh, that we find. So I, I love that you were willing to be flexible and uh, try something new, even though I would have been afraid of breaking an arm or a leg or hurting someone else more, actually more appropriately knocking someone down by accident, not on purpose. So <laughs> um, tell me to, so we just wrap up a little bit, because I'd like to, for you to, you know, um, share a little bit about your work, who you are here to help, etc. Mm -hmm. if you have an offer. And also, you know, being able to do what you do now um, for these years, like how fulfilling is that when you think back to that moment where you were like, hey, wait, there was this imbalance. So mm -hmm. I realize that's two questions, but they're kind of intertwined. Yeah, I love the work that I do now because really it's brought together all of the lessons I've learned yeah. throughout my life. And uh, really, I, I love helping women to build their own businesses and achieve financial freedom through entrepreneurship and really see it's more about seeing that we each have value to offer the world, yes. right? And that there's plenty of people on this planet that are willing to pay you to receive that value. And right. so, um, so I love teaching and coaching and helping women um, see that also. That's what I've learned over the course of my life and career. Um, I've also learned that you can have it all. You can have a beautiful business and a beautiful life. Mm -hmm. And um and so I love teaching that and teaching how to build business very simply yeah. and have joy in the process. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And yes. For those of you who are listening on Apple, you're not seeing me nod my head, clap my hands, but uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And yes. Um, I agree. And, and I, I love that. I think that sometimes people don't realize just how worthy they are of those desires, you know, mm -hmm. I believe they deserve them. And they're really, sometimes it's the naysayer in, in their own head that's pulling them back. Well, I grew up in a house that I'm not sure if I can, whatever that might be. And yeah. to your point about the fact that there are, you know, people who value what that person 
has to offer, the impact they're here to make, whatever the teachings they bring is huge. Yeah. Especially now, like you were saying, right? I think I read 2005 when you started your online business. It feels like yesterday, but I'm realizing now it's almost 20 years. Uh, <laughs> But I'm still here. So it's yes, good. and thriving in a big way. But um, right with the internet, there's so much business to go around. Mm -hmm. um, that was an article I was putting together recently about competition. Or and we just had a podcast episode last week about how some people are constantly looking over the shoulder and how that brings about this imbalance in, in our life in sometimes mm -hmm. even in our health where we become uneased and then become diseased, you know, mm -hmm. where uh, we're kind of just breaking down because we're constantly looking, what is, what are they doing? Trying to keep up. And there's so much to go around. I know that I repel some people by the way I look, by the way I sound, and it's okay. I'd rather, right? We, some people are very instantaneously attracted to us and others are like, yeah, she's not for me. And I, I actually love that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that point up. Very, very glad. And all of Melissa's information is here in the show notes. Please reach out to her. You will have as much fun as I have had with her today. And was there anything else you wanted to uh, mention, Melissa, before I pull a card from the deck of cards? Uh, let's see that I am always offering classes, have lots of um, free experiences too. So please feel free to check me out on uh, my website and let's get to know each other on social media. I love that. Yes. And mm. that is such a blessing about social media, being able to connect with people mm. and then, um, you know, f learn all the different offerings you have, etc. So I'm going to pull a card now from the opening to possibilities deck. Yay. I shuffled them before we started. I'll just do one quick one more time. And then if you don't mind, Melissa, just tell me when to stop. I'll start thumbing through. Tell me which card. Stop. Okay. I Which card is it? The. Oh, I don't know. I was looking at the flower one. Well, I guess they both have flowers. The lighter color, the one on, I yes. guess, your left. This one. Yes. yes. There we go. Um, breathing. Long, slow breathing brings clarity to your mind. Mm. How often do you breathe mindfully? There's three questions. I'll read them in a row and then you decide which ones you want to answer. How often do you breathe mindfully? How do you allow your breath to bring clarity to your mind? And what happens when you're not breathing with awareness? I know that answer for myself. No. <laughs> yeah, I have started to use breath so much more. I have a good friend of mine that has become, uh, has, is a breath work, um, has a breath work practice now. And so I'm learning a lot more about breathing as far as helping to regulate my nervous system yes. and to focus. Um, I use breathing at night when I wake up in the night and I can't fall back asleep. Mm. There's a specific pattern that I use that always helps me fall back asleep. Which one do you use, Melissa, if you don't mind, do share? I think it's a, a Dr. Andrew Weil um, from him, but will you breathe in for four and then you use four counts yeah. and you hold for seven and then Correct. you exhale for eight. Yes. And you do that four times. And mm -hmm. that's like a magic sleeping pill for me. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's, it's right for out. most people, for most people. Yeah. It's a wonderful one. It is from him and it's phenomenal. Having, having taught yoga for quite a long time, more than a decade, um, mm. breathing is so important. And I used to tell students that, you know, it's like you're driving down the road and maybe a squirrel jumps out and, <gasps> and then, you know, five minutes later, you're still not breathing. You're still, <gasps> You know, and I think so often we don't realize that we, we haven't really sat and taken a full breath. So mm -hmm. um, I am glad you're doing that. I'm glad that during the night, if you do wake up, that's working for you because there's nothing worse than losing a good night's sleep, you know, um, especially when you have so many people looking 
forward to hearing your voice and your teachings. So Melissa, you have been so much fun. Um, really enjoyed getting to know you better and hearing you share so transparently about how you were able to take tragedy and make it an opportunity and really allow that to cause a ripple effect, not only for your life, but for all the people that you touch. So thank you from my heart to yours. Thank you so much. It's been so great to get to talk with you. Thank you. So if you are at a point in your life where you're ready to step up and make a bold, brave and courageous stand and maybe step into a place where you're making an impact or simply changing the way you're living and being and experiencing this magical world, reach out to me. I'd love to see if we can have a chat and if I can help you further. Till next time, be exquisite.